Well, right now, what's the real problem? The real problem is we don't have enough people to build homes. What, you, what should you be doing? The government should be sending stimulus money for jobs in the building sector. They should be giving tax write-offs for people to, to start building companies. They should be subsidizing perhaps land or building costs that have gone up wildly and saying, guys, we're putting a ceiling, the, the, you know, wood is tripled. We're gonna bring that back down to help you build these homes. In other words, help builders build more homes. That's the real problem. Chris, can we talk about the thing that everybody is talking about right now? It depends. Some things are not safe to talk about. <laughs> yeah. this, one, this one is safe to talk about. The economy. Yeah. The world economy. Yep. The past, what, 24 months have been pretty turbulent. It has, been, you say? it has been so crazy, dude. Check out the stat. I just heard that, did you know there were like 51 million millionaires in the world? And during COVID... 5.2 more millionaires emerged. It was one of the most prosperous millionaires time. or billionaires. Millionaires. So hmm. we had literally we saw an increase globally of 10% millionaires added to the bottom line globally, and yet other people got insanely hurt. Certain sectors are doing so well, others are are being smashed to bits. It's like the world is being recreated out of all this madness. Yeah, you know that that song that came out by Bo Burnham, Jeff Bezos? It's all about this like entrepreneur, but it's like yeah. kind of making fun of him for being the one guy that benefited yeah. so massively. Yeah, but at least the world is starting to change their tune on entrepreneurship, dude. When I yeah. became an entrepreneur almost two decades ago, people would like, they, they, they like kind of frowned at it. It's like, dude, what's wrong with you? Hello, go to college, work for somebody else, duh. And, I'm, and entrepreneurs, I think, felt slighted. And it's either that or I'm just joining a lot of entrepreneurial communities over the years, but it's like entrepreneurialism is becoming popular. Gen Z, like 90-something percent of them are like, what do you want to be when you grow up? Entrepreneur. I want to be an entrepreneur. Then why are you in college? Yep. Uh, so check it. At the beginning of 2020, I saw so many videos about how COVID was going to destroy the real estate market. Yeah. And if I remember right, Chris, your videos were some of the few that said, hold up, hold up, hold up. This can't be right. The numbers don't make sense. Just because the stock market's tanking yeah. doesn't mean real estate's well, tanking. Well, for every five recessions, two out of the five, there's a, there, there's a coinciding of a real estate crash with a stock market crash. We are not lined up for that at all. In fact, these two markets are moving in such opposite directions. I did a whole YouTube video talking about the last five recessions and talking about the dynamics at play. The dynamics are more diametrically opposed right now than ever before, which means the stock market is two years delayed in one of its biggest, most all-time epic crashes. Real estate, however, for the next seven to 10 years is going to be so strong because we have such a rapid, such a massive supply and demand issue. So state of the economy, I mean, crypto's doing its thing that's just crazy volatile. The stock market does its thing. Real estate, like you said, is just doing something very, very different than everything else. Yeah, but you have certain sectors that are being destroyed right now. I mean, commercial is going yeah. into a massive recreation. The, the hotel industry, the accommodations, you know, Airbnb, that went through its certain turmoil. Yeah. Traveling is back up, so that's starting to work again. Uh, but, uh, you know, a lot of real estate, um, you know, sectors really got smashed. Single family, for the first time ever, became the most popular. Yep. Because um, literally the American dream was literally dying over a generation, over a decade. We were going to go from 70% of households owning their own single family home to 60%. It was going to drop Which to is 59%. Massive when you think about but then all of a sudden COVID could, uh, just totally turned that around because all of a sudden owning your own home became the most important thing to people because they're like, well, I guess we're, we're not going to commute and drive to you know, offices anymore, which means I need a different house. I need a house that I can live in and call home. I also need a house I can work in and call the office. Yeah. So it's created different problems though. The, what what well, was the median I, I, home big price? Big problems means big opportunities. It right? does. It does. Yep. It certainly does. Hence 5.2 million millionaires. What was the median home price before? The median home price at the end of 2019, right, right, right before the pandemic, the median home price was hovering right under two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. And now, what's it at? Um, I think last month it was at three hundred and sixty-two thousand dollars. So it's up up one hundred and ten thousand dollars over the last eighteen months. That's so crazy. And I'm predicting in the next five years it will likely surpass a half a million dollars before we actually get the big correction. 
And that's wild when you actually think of the prices of real estate nationwide on average to- doubling. The average price doubling. Because who can afford a half million dollar home? You have... Okay. Don't you have to double incomes to be able to double that? I think the government's doing their part and saying, well, we'll start throwing in a lot of resources and some extra money here and there. I'm like, well, that's not how you can run a company. Yeah, you can't run a company, aka an economy, long term on just printing money to solve people's problems, especially when GDP is not supporting it. So the, this home price thing, this median home price, which means if the median's gone up yeah. and you're wanting to buy above the median... Like the home, the, the prices of home have just gotten crazy. Utah yeah, is Yeah, but no, 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 but no, let me temper that. Let me temper that. Yeah. A $2 million home has not become a $4 million home because no, I mean, you're, we're seeing, we're seeing in the lower income housing homes under a million, they've seen, um, some massive appreciation. And, and part of that, by the way, is not just, wow, I guess we're in this growth spike. I'm like, no, this is called inflation. And this means that our dollar is rapidly devaluing and the inverse effect occurs in the game of real estate. Anytime hyperinflation is a fear on people's minds, buy as much hard asset as you possibly can, AKA real estate. Right. Uh, Utah's a perfect example though, because this market is crazy. Provo, Utah, where this building is that we're sitting in right now is number four in the entire nation for the most inflated market by 50%. Inflated meaning prices are higher than they probably should, should be. be. And they're going to have to correct. Chris, Everything will eventually correct. There's this house, this beautiful house in a neighborhood that we really like, and it came up for sale. And we're like, what are the chances? And we went and looked at it. And found out that what was like a seven hundred fifty eight hundred thousand dollar home, they were asking one point three million dollars for. Yep. And you just look at it and you're like, that's not a, that's a nice house, but it's not a million dollar home. Yeah. Well, and and someone is going to buy it for one one point three. Chris, inside and, of two weeks, it was under contract. Yep. Uh huh. And by the way, when that <laughs> when that uh, when the market corrects, that person is going to be sitting with a one point two million dollar mortgage, and. Their house is going to be worth eight hundred thousand dollars. They're going to be four hundred thousand upside down, and you know what? They're going to be placed with this dilemma: Do we give it back to the bank, or do we hold on to it because it's it. our home? And unfortunately, during a correction, a lot of homes go back to the to the bank when people are upside down. Yeah. Um, yeah. Even though they have the financial abilities to actually support that upside downness, the they don't want to. Yeah. There's fear. There's you know you know debt is a is a really powerful scarcity driven mindset that a lot of people are possessed with. And the moment they're upside down on a house, time will correct it. But if they can't live with it, then they're just going to give it back to the bank. It's funny because the value of a home only really matters when you go to sell. Yeah. And yet people attach this emotion but to why? it. But why? But, 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 but because gotta, you want to be like, oh, my house is improving in value. It's yeah, worth there's, more. There's a feeling that comes with it. But remember that house that they bought for 1.3 that is now worth eight, you can go pick up at an auction for maybe six yeah. or five. So they're like, oh my gosh, houses are... The same house for half the cost, we feel stupid. But giving it back to the bank isn't the solution. No, but that's you, unfortunately... You, you don't know, sell at the bottom. That, that is the problem with being a one-income society or a dual-income society. Talk to me about that. You know, I remember reading a book years ago called Multiple Streams of Income. It was early 2000s. It was written by Robert G. Allen. He's now a business partner of mine in one of my companies. And Bob's a really, really great guy. And when he wrote the book, it was all based on this premise that in the 50s, you could all live off of a family, which meant in a, in a relationship with two people, one could work and one could stay home. Uh, things have inflated, things have become more expensive. Maybe we've also adjusted our lifestyle, you know, here in America, Certainly. you know, keeping up with the Joneses. And so we moved to a dual income society. Now we're nearly at a triple income society. Well, what, where will we be in 20 or 30 years? People will need four or five incomes to get by, to sustain their standard of living. And, um, that's why I, I, there's a huge call. I, I, what I really rep, a lot of people are like, oh yeah, Chris, he's that real estate mogul, that tycoon, that guy who makes millions of dollars. I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm a financial educator. And all I do is making money is easy. Building wealth is easy. Poor people are going to listen to this and get pissed right now. It is easy to get rich. First, you just got to get educated. And then you got to get some friends that are making good financial choices. And then you got to give it time. Anyone can be wealthy. Unfortunately, people are either poor for making dumb decisions or they're middle-class poor because they have a money disorder. By the way, people don't know that there's a real condition called a money disorder. And it's where you're so addicted to saving money, almost like a sickness, that you can't allow yourself to enjoy life or spend money on something that might be good or useful or helpful. You haven't learned how to spend money. There's an art to also spending money. It's not all bad. You know, there's, a, there's like three phases. You've got to first become a saveaholic, 
like get addicted to saving for a period of life so that you can then become an investaholic that has money to invest so that you can become a spendaholic that can create maximum joy and freedom from how you reallocate your resources, whether it's for a Ferrari or for it's a charitable organization to do good for people in the world. I'm here as a financial educator telling people, get smart about money, make smart financial moves, and you'll have more options. That's all money is. Money is more options. It's not, it's not how rich are you, it's how many options do you have? Because it doesn't mean you have to have a million dollar house, doesn't mean you have to have a $10 million house, doesn't mean you need to drive cars like me or get a private plane or any of those things. It means you have options. Yeah. And ultimately, people with more options tend to have more emotional options in life. Hmm. They say money doesn't buy happiness, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I, I say that not having enough money produces a lot of stress, anxiety. We know that it's the number one wrecker of marriages. So um, does that mean that money buys happiness? Kind of. It, it gives you more possibilities. And when you don't have enough options, uh, you know, you feel like you're in the hole. Yeah. Well, Chris, these, these circumstances of the economy, everybody's kind of approaching these problems from different angles. And uh, I want, I'm going to share a headline with you. And I'm just I'm interested in getting a hot take from you. And I mean, note that this is from a politician and it's interesting, you know, a hammer looks around and they see everything as a nail. Sure. A politician is always going to try and solve a problem through policy. Yeah. Right. But so I'm interested to hear your thoughts on this and then your take yeah. on maybe if you have any ideas on a better way that we could solve this. Okay. So check this out. The Real Deal um, online magazine. Canadian PM, Prime Minister Trudeau pledges two-year ban on foreign home buyers. So mm. anybody outside who is a foreigner who is not a citizen of Canada, he wants to ban them from buying single-family homes. So it's pretty obvious what they're trying to do there. They're saying, we don't have enough homes for quote unquote, our people. Right. The last thing we need is foreign investors coming in and actually buying up these homes. I don't think it's an attack on, on foreigners coming in to actually buy a home to live in. I think it's more an attack on the fact that hedge funds, even in America, everywhere, they're just gobbling up real estate like crazy. They're paying 125% of value. You list it for 400,000, they're buying it for 450 or 500,000 yeah. or more. And they can do cash offers. And, They've and, got and leverage. I'm going to tell other you other right now why don't. they're doing that. It, it, on the one hand, I'm like, you guys are stupid. On the other hand, in five years, they're going to say, were we? Weren't we really smart? Weren't we really intelligent? Because here's what they understand we are missing somewhere between two and four million homes. Right. If you trust the Wall Street Journal, they're saying, based on the demand of millennials largely that want a home that they can live in, it's not so much of a, want, a need, more of a want. They're going to say that that number is closer to four. Uh, but if you look at the stats right before the pandemic, it was about 2.1 missing million homes in this country. And when you say missing homes, you're saying homes that... Means, that, that, that means that there are people saying, if we had 2.1 million homes right now, within I'd six months, we would have buyers for all of them. So there's high demand, There's low a high inventory. demand, but there's no supply. And uh, just like anything, like, for example, check out this globe. If you guys, you know, if, you, if you're listening, you can't see this, but I have this... This globe that floats, um, you know, above my desk, and it and it just rotates, and people are mesmerized. They're like, "Is there a battery in that thing?" I'm like, "Actually, there's like some weird chemicals that, that that you feel the gravitational pull of the Earth, and they rotate this globe." And let's just say this was the only one on the planet. They might sell them for five hundred bucks, but someone might pay five thousand or ten thousand or fifty thousand because there's just one. There's only one of them. I mean, the diamond industry is built. Same on Same thing. We have fewer homes right now, like diamonds. We have fewer homes than ever before, and what it's doing is it's skyrocketing those values. Of course, you have inflation and other things that are catering into it, and it's not going to last forever. But if our current um, builder market builds maximum number of homes for seven to ten years, they, it'll take seven to ten years before they actually satisfy that that demand. So that's what's causing these prices to go up. So I think the prime minister is basically saying, hey, um, we, need to, we need to actually prioritize these homes for our people that yeah. live in this country and not large corporations that are just going to come in and just buy them up and say, yeah, we're just going to rent these homes out. We're going to make a killing and not your people. In other words, I think the government's trying to influence who gets the benefit. Yeah. So it's interesting because I know a similar policy is uh, looking at being implemented in the Netherlands. And I think there will probably be other nations that are a little bit more yeah. socialist leaning that, that like this idea. Sure. But there's similar ideas being passed around in America. Yeah. And I'm wondering what, you, what your thoughts are on. You know, on it's that. interesting. You've got, you've got um, you know, Blackstone, Warren Buffett's hedge fund, one yeah. of the largest, right now the largest hedge fund. 
they're buying up real estate like crazy. They were competing against me in 2008. Uh, I had been in Phoenix for I don't know, about a couple thousand homes before they actually hit the scene. And we did $100 million of profits on that market in Vegas within a five-year period of time. And they came in and started buying up like crazy. They're doing the same thing. They're ahead of the game right now than they were in 2008. And so government making policies, keeping large firms and hedge funds from actually buying up the real estate, I can see some of the wisdom in that. There's another part of it that kind of bothers me a little bit, though. Okay. Uh, because you have to consider the entire private sector. And um, I, for example, partner with people all over the world. And as an investors, we buy properties. And so if the government were to say, hey, Chris, you are also included in this hedge fund category and you can't buy real estate. Uh, part of me says, okay, so I understand that you're trying to benefit um, you know, people that need houses and you're trying to prioritize to homeowners right now because we have such a, a shortage. On the other hand, I'm saying, yeah, but what about your hustlers? Your Americans that in this country produce your GDP. You know, half of all GDP is built on the backbone of small business owners. Uh -huh. So what is a real estate business? What is a real estate investor? It's a small business. And what they're doing is they're saying, we have faith and we believe in the market and we're willing to take risks and we want to buy these homes and we'll put up the capital and we want to rent them out and we want to make the money on them. And so I really hope that whatever policies come about don't end up hurting those individuals um, because we got to get really clear that... A lot of people always confuse the rich and the poor as these two massive different markets. Poor people, you know, are on food stamps and rich people own jets. It, it doesn't work that way. When you actually look at our tax code, the government starts considering you rich when you make $100,000 a year. Yeah. Not people that make 50 or 40 or 30 or 27,000 in poverty level, right? You're saying $100,000 doesn't get you a I'm jet. saying $100,000, that person needs to make three, four, five hundred thousand dollars $500,000 a year before they would really start to consider themselves wealthy and actually be able to pass on real generational wealth. And are we punishing that sector? You know, it's one thing, um, you know, historically there's, uh, you know, the, you know, politics are always trying to, the, the politicians are always trying to figure out where do we get the money for all the programs that we want, all the social programs, especially all the new ones. Like, you know, this last bill, the government comes out and they're like, hey, we, we now think that it should be a constitutional right that, you're, ye, yea, therefore, all ye people, your internet shall be provided for by us, the government. I'm like, really? So, so there, we're, now, we're now charging, we're taking tax money to provide internet for people like this. This is an unalienable human right. Do I think that that's maybe a ridiculous by a lot? I do. I think that that's pretty stupid. Um, I'd rather see my tax dollars go to things that are maybe more important. Um, you know, I don't want to go down that road. The point is, is that the government always has to find a way to get some extra money in, in how it taxes its people. Right now, you've got the wealthy that are being taxed. You know, you know um, some of them have marginal rates as high as 45%. Yeah. That's like saying, hey, by the way, go start a business. If you can't succeed, then you can write off those losses. But if you do and you succeed a lot, we, the government, are your silent business partner. And we're going to, we, we're, like we're like a monkey on your back. And we're going to pull out of your pocket and extract 45 cents on every Close dollar of uh, profits that you make. It's pretty, it's, it's pretty crazy. And right now, obviously, this, they want to keep, they want to increase the corporate taxes. And so I get it. You know, you get a lot of people that don't have money that look at that and they're like, well, why shouldn't they? The rich people, they, they've made so much money. We shouldn't, you know, like, are you taxing them proportionally? Are you taxing them unfairly? They're looking for money to pay for all of their choices that they can't afford. That, what I would say they can't afford. Like, we have a lot of stupid programs out there. The government is trying to pay for a lot of stuff. I'm like, why are you printing money and creating this inflation and risking hyperinflation? In the end, you're gonna hurt us, but because it may not hurt you during your term, someone's gonna have to pay the price, and ultimately, we the people will pay the ultimate price. Don't do that, don't risk our freedom, and don't, don't, don't risk a, a, a great country by enacting policy that um, has unintended consequence. So while you might be trying to favor, you know, maybe lower income people trying to get into homes, that's a good thing. The question is, how do you do it? Don't punish your worker bees that produce half of the nation's GDP. These are the people that make between $50,000 and $200,000 a year. They're not rich. They do have more money. But don't forget maybe that they went to college for that or that they've worked hard for that or they've climbed, a, they've hustled, they've climbed a corporate ladder um, you know, if you are going to punish somebody, don't, don't punish people that have just gotten a few, few steps higher up on the rungs of the ladder. So, uh, there's another article here from Slate talking about the same issue. And they say that in the first quarter of 2020, um, 
15% of homes were purchased by what they call corporate investors. So these are this hedge fund type, or quite frankly, any of our entities that are out there buying single family homes would fall yep. into this category. So my question to you, 15% of homes. That's not a lot. Them, is that significant or is that not significant? Well, I mean, it's, I, it's certainly significant, but it's not 30%. It's not 50%. It's not 80%. That means that the majority of the homes that are being purchased right now are for likely families that are buying homes that they can live in themselves. And I, I don't think that's an unhealthy ratio. Why? Because remember, you know, some of those organizations and stats and figures are going to come from the uber wealthy, but I bet a lot of it also just comes from average everyday people that are saying, mom hey, and I, pop I see real estate shops, yeah, mom and pop shops that are saying, I see real estate as a valid way to get ahead. And that's the game that they're playing. Don't hurt people that are trying to get ahead that haven't quote unquote made it yet. They're not rich. They're, they're, but, they're, but they're a very important subset of our society that you shouldn't punish. You should encourage them. That's a group of people that you want to nurture and take care of. So um, in all the businesses that I run, you know, every, you know, the cool thing about owning a business is in some, sometimes I wake up and I feel a little bit like God. Like God created this whole earth, but it's unfinished. And now I get to start a business and I, I'm in co-creation and I get to say, what are the laws of my land? Like, what are my policies, my SOPs, my KPIs? How do I hire people? What's my culture like? What do I want it to be here? I remember as a kid growing up living in Seattle, Microsoft town, that people would talk about, oh my gosh, one in every five Microsofties, one in every 10 is a millionaire. And when they go to work, they get to unlimited drinks from the Coke machines that they don't have to pay for. And they come in their jammies and they put their toes up and First cool seems culture. so cool and cushy. And I was like, man, being a business owner, a successful business owner, which by the way, you have to pay your stripes to get there. You become a successful business owner. You get to kind of, it's a, it's a creation that you're putting together. And you know, I, I look at that and I, I don't want to be punished for the, my creation. I want to be helped because remember, I'm not just working for someone else's company. We need those people, but don't forget that we also need entrepreneurs that will start companies and be careful how you tax them. Take care of them. Help them feel appreciated. Make sure they have ample tax write-offs. You know, when, when Trump came into power a uh, year or so later in 2017, there was a lot of tax breaks that got wiped out. And he introduced Section 199A. And it almost felt like an automatic 20% off your corporate tax. And I won't go into the details of really what it is, but it was a way to say, hey, we're, we're, let's see if we can do something here for you. You know, 199A is still in effect, and that lowered my marginal tax rate by 5%. I was very, very grateful for that. There was some significant savings. Things like that help create a little bit of balance where it's not just beat and whip that pony all the way up, that, that, that donkey all the way up the hill until it, it, it just keels over and dies. Chris, can I ask you a little bit of an unfair question? I love unfair questions. <laughs> so let's, let's say that the, you're right, and the home median price just keeps going up and up and up, sure. and home prices just continue to inflate, and it gets harder and harder for the average household to purchase a home. Yeah. What would you do about it? We said how politicians, yeah, it, they'll it, see well, everything as First of all, a, here's like, so, so there's always multiple ways of solving problems. Right. How should the government be spending its money? Should it be penalizing a subset of its people that are stimulating the economy? Probably Or not. should it put its money towards the real problem? You see, in business, and a, and a government is just a business. It's very it complicated. It's the, most, it's the most complicated business on the planet. And there are problems and symptoms of problems. And often when we see politicians go after symptoms of problems, they throw money at it and it doesn't solve the actual problem. They made the symptom go away. It's like going to a doctor that can say, take this pill, we're gonna mask the rash. But by the way, the real problem that will turn into cancer someday is still there. That's a problem. So you know, business owners are always trying to diagnose what's a problem, what's a symptom? What's a problem, what's a symptom? It takes a lot of critical thinking and sometimes some trial and error and getting it wrong can cost you dearly or even end a business. Well, right now, what's the real problem? The real problem is we don't have enough people to build homes. What, you, mm -hmm. what should you be doing? The government should be sending stimulus money for jobs in the building sector. They should be giving tax write-offs for people to, to start building companies. They should be subsidizing perhaps land or building costs that have gone up wildly and saying, guys, we're putting a ceiling, the, the, you know, wood is tripled. We're gonna bring that back down to help you build these homes. In other words, help builders build more homes. That's the real problem. That's yeah. the problem. So throw money at the problem, not at the symptom. 
All right, guys, you heard it. Vote for Crone. What is it, 2028? <laughs> yeah, not 2024, not 2028. Not You're ever. Not running for I know, I'm going to make billions, actually, and I'm going to give my billions away. I'm going to solve world problems uh, on my terms without having to go through the messy That's awesome. Stuff. That's actually a really good idea, Chris. Yeah. Incentivize the real a solution to the real problem, which is not enough homes. Well, and made. understand that for today, you can still be an investor of real estate. Yep. And I hope they don't change that. I would hate if that they, they would change that. Uh, but it means that if you've ever thought of investing in the game of real estate, you probably couldn't pick a more profitable time of the century when you study cycles. You're choosing to get in at the very best time. Uh, well, and, and honestly, Chris, like I mentioned, Utah's just insane right now. And I, I would be crazy to be looking at investment properties in Utah right yep. now. And and I just feel very fortunate to be, you know, uh, working with your company and, and learning how to buy properties in the best markets in America that aren't seeing median home prices. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, there's high. anyone here that's listening. That's like, wow, wait, you could, you do that. Some of you don't know that. Some of you have no idea who I am. You're like, are you, are you the business builder? Are you the real estate guy? Or like, who are you? Um, so I do have people all over the world that will partner with me and I only go in the top five out of 324 markets where the hedge funds are not. And by being in those markets, we are dominating. My purchase prices are still in the $200,000, mm -hmm. $250,000 range. In our ROIs, they are so serious, double digit. They're roughly double from what they're already at, which already leads to multi millions of dollars you know, in your working life by being a successful investor. So everything's accelerated right now. Um, and, and people that, if you're, if you're liking this message and you don't know that I do that, you should look into it. Yeah, if you hit up chriscrone.com forward slash partnering, you'll get a lot of information about what it takes to become a partner and, and utilize Chris's team to go out there and buy real estate.